Hello, and welcome to a bonus box for Warhammer 40k's Grim History from the Beyond. I am Zekthar, and today I will give chronicling of the strange history of John Grammaticus. Now, as most of you know, especially those of you who listen to Alpha Legion and the Cabal, John Grammaticus's story is strange and seemed to be full of holes, plot threads, and characters seemingly disappearing out of the record. Well, through careful digging and much time researching the many books of our hallowed library, I've found some answers to our many questions about the man. From what we discussed in our Vox about the Cabal, I found very little extra about John before his meeting with Alpharius, and what my dear brother Euxen said about the meeting itself is fairly accurate. So I think what happened after this is an excellent place to start. Now, if you have questions about what took place before, just head to our Spotify podcast or wherever you found these boxes and look up Alpha Legion and the Cabal 9-12-23 and go to the time of 2754. There we will find Euxen's chronicling of before and after the meeting of Alpharius. But enough about that. On with the show. We will start with John after feeling distraught about having sided against humanity and trying to kill himself, launching himself out of an airlock. Yet, this didn't do the trick because John was a perpetual. Now, a perpetual was an individual who was a member of the mutant branch of human species who possessed seemingly superhuman abilities, the most important of which was immortality, for which they are named. Perpetuals never age and are capable of ultimately healing almost any injury as a result of their extraordinary, rapid, and excellent cellular regeneration. Perpetuals have been known to survive dismemberment, suffocation, decapitation, and even complete disintegration by direct energy assaults of atmospheric re-entry, their bodies always regenerating and even bringing them back to life after clinical death. Humans can naturally be born as perpetuals or can be artificially transformed into one through the use of advanced alien technology, such as that used by the Xenos Alliance known as the Cabal. John is of this latter group, and because the Cabal made him into perpetual, they pretty much owned him for all time. Another reason why he tried to end it all. Now at this time, John disappears from the records, something that he does occasionally, and to tell you the truth, it's just downright frustrating. <laughs> But we find him again, approximately two Terran years later, after the Horus heresy had begun in earnest, and he is once again working for the Cabal. Grammaticus was tasked by the Cabal to reactivate Ol Person, another human Cabal agent, and his old friend, who is also a perpetual. Though Person's immortality was a result of true congenital genetic mutation rather than the product of a Cabal's genetic tampering. Now before we get into their meeting, we must talk about this new perpetual, Ol Person. Now, some of you might recognize or find some familiarity with the name, and that is because he became a famous myth within the Imperial Guard known as St. Olenius Pius. Olenius Pius was a legendary figure said to be a guardsman who sacrificed his life to save the emperor during the siege of the Imperial Palace. He is considered a saint within the Imperial Guard, and his image is often displayed on regimental banners. Yet the story of Ol Parson is far more complicated than this tale of single heroic deed, which needs to be explained. Now, the perpetual Elanius Person, to give his full name, has lived so many lives that he has forgotten his true age. Yet, I estimate that as of the Horus Heresy, he was roughly 45,000 years old, give or take a few thousand years, putting his date of birth around 15,000 BC in the city of Nineveh. If my estimations are correct, that would make him even older than the emperor, who, according to older sources, was born around 8,000 BC, making him the oldest perpetual on record. In Terra's ancient past, Olenius acted as war master of the emperor's armies during a war in the East Phoenician against a chaos cult said to be proto-cognite. The emperor and Olenius' army besieged a massive tower etched in Ununcia, an ancient warp language that was being erected. After emerging victorious, Elenius sought to destroy the tower and all the dark knowledge it contained. However, the emperor refused, instead wishing to preserve the knowledge for use against future threats. Disenchanted with the emperor, Elenius stabbed him with a dagger before using Anuncia to destroy the tower and escape. Now this might shock you. What? Someone stabbed the Big E and wasn't exploded into a million pieces? 
Well, remember, this is ages past, far before the Big E was the godlike creature he was during the time of the Great Crusade. Honestly, though, I think a small part of the Emperor agreed with Ol, and simply let the Perpetual disappear, knowing that exile was a decent enough punishment for refusing to side with him. Ol Persson's exile lasted for some time, and he does not show back up again in the records until the early 31st millennium. By the 31st millennium, Olenius Persson had become known as Pius Ol Persson because of his devout belief in the Catharic religion and was a civilian farmer of Kalth in the Ultramar system. Before this, he had served as a soldier in the Imperial Army who earned the right to retire, being gifted with the service shares for a plot of land proportionate to his years served. He decided to cash them in on Kalth, taking on 20 hectares of land. He chose Kalth for two reasons. The first was if service shares were used to buy land on a world newly opened for colonization, travel fares to that world were paid for. The second was that out in the further reaches of the Imperium under the banner of the New Empire, being forged by Rabute Gilman and his ultramarines, Persson felt that it would be easier to practice his faith without incident. Religious faith was widely looked down upon in the Imperium as unscientific nonsense. Persson settled down on Kalth, living comfortably enough for 18 years. The only indicators of his past as a soldier were the fading tattoo on his arm, the battered Laz rifle mounted on his wall, and a company of an ex-army loader servitor named Graft that could not be dissuaded from returning to Ol as Trooper Persson. To others, including his neighbors and several employees, he was just old, pious Ol. Ol was present on Kalth when the word bearers attacked the Ultramarines during the Great Betrayal. If you want information on this battle, may I recommend the Battle of Kalth, Part 1? Anyways, the initial strikes from the impacting orbital debris, once shipyards and vessels of the Ultramarine fleet, reminded him terrifyingly of his last campaign in the army upon the world of Chrysophor. Ol turned to his faith to help him survive during this time, and was knocked unconscious shortly after uttering a prayer to his god. During this unconscious period, Ol appeared to dream of being visited by an old friend of his. John Grammaticus. Yet this was no mere dream. John was contacting the old soldier psychically, yet Ol Persson was having none of it. Unwilling to converse with Grammaticus, Ol attempted to carry on preparing breakfast for his wife. John shook his head sadly, caught watching this sad tableau. Grammaticus broke the scene and was forced to remind Persson that his wife died long before he joined the army, long before the last time he joined the army be exact. Ole also refused to listen to John's attempts to remind him of their old brotherhood in arms in such conflicts as those that took place on an atoll hive in the Pan Pacific on Terra several lifetimes ago. Finally, Grammaticus used Ole's status as one of the few remaining perpetuals in existence and the onus that that came with. With a reluctant growl, Ole Persson sat in a chair and listened to what his old colleague had to say. Grammaticus delivered the news that without their intervention, the emperor was going to lose the war, and that if he lost, the human race would lose. Grammaticus urged his old friend to leave Kalth via immaterial sidestep and gain an object for him. When Persson asked where he was supposed to go, Grammaticus replied that he would show him. Persson then found himself transported from his comfortable dream environment to one of horror, aboard a space vessel at war but a vessel that was unnatural and disturbing, orbiting a burning terra. Entering a massive chamber, he encountered a dead angel lying upon the floor, his brutal killer standing nearby. Taken aback by the unholy appearance of the angel's murderer, he raised his Caltheric symbol and audibly renounced the evil one that stood before him. The killer took a step towards Ol, but stopped, his attention caught by something held in Persol's hand. Before he could figure out what was in his hand, he was distracted by a golden light coming from behind. It flooded the chamber, a light all recognized as one he used to know, but weaker and sullied. Announcing that he had seen enough, he heard Grammaticus speak, as if bringing him to wakefulness. Waking up in what was left of his lands, Persson resolved to escape from the ongoing Battle of Kalt, aiding a number of other survivors on the way, many of whom banded together with him and accompanied him off-world. Before leaving, he managed to acquire an athame ritual blade from a chaos cultist that he believed may be the item he was supposed to fetch, 
to be used for something utterly important. Person and his survivors consisted of Graft, Dogent Crank, Bale Rain, Hybet Zebs, and Cat. They left Kalth by using an apparent sorceress techniques. He used the Athame to open what appeared to be a form of warp gate and step through. Now, for the next six years, Parson and his small band wandered through both space and time using the Athame and the warp sensitive compass, attempting to reach Terra at the behest of Grammaticus. They were hunted by a variety of foes the word bearers, Alpha Legion, demons, and assassins of the Cabal bent on seeing Horus's victory. On the world of Anthriok, they emerged shortly after the end of the revolt of the Iron Men and became stranded for two years. There, Person speculated on what to do next, but was confronted by John Grammaticus, who urged him to go back. However, Person saw through the deception and killed Grammaticus with the Athen, revealing that his friend was a shape-shifting imposter of the Elf Legion. With few options left, Person led his band through the cosmic void left behind by the Iron Men that he would have preferred to avoid. Now we will catch up with old Person on Terra, but for now we have to return to the 31st millennium to see what John's up to. Disguised as a frontier archaeologist, Serene Sabaton, Grammaticus had been tasked to come to Traoris to obtain a relic from the ancient ruins of the fortress built by Chaos Cultus millennia ago. Within the fortress was buried a spear, though not truly a spear as such. It was in fact a piece of fulgurite, a fork of lightning crystallized in rock. The sublime artifact had been formed from the infinite power of the emperor when he annihilated the servants of the ruinous powers in millennia past. The dark apostle Vedric Elias hoped to obtain the relic in order to utilize the divine power within to ascend to demonhood. Realizing he was out of time, Grammaticus knew he was being tracked by the word bearers and attempted to flee. He was only saved through the intervention of First Captain Ortulius Numion, the commander of the Salamander Legion's Pyre Guard, and his ragtag group of loyalist survivors of the Dropsite Massacre on Estvon V. Only 23 Space Marines follow the First Captain, most of which were the Pyre Guard. Yet along for the ride were two Iron Hands and two Raven Guard. Informing the Salamander Captain of his true identity and nature, Grammaticus also informed Nubian that the mysterious relic was somehow tied to the Salamander's missing Primarch Vulcan. But as to how, he could not say. Though initially distrustful of the mortal, Nubian relented and attempted to help Grammaticus escape off-world. The remaining loyalists were being hunted by the relentless word-bearer's huntsman, Barthusa Narek, a servant of the Dark Apostle Elias, as well as the Chaos Cultus of Traoris. Over the course of making their way towards Traoris's lone space force, many of the surviving Astartes were killed. The Raven Guard had hidden a Thunderhawk gunship within the lightning fields located on the high peaks that surrounded the spaceport, while some of the surviving loyalists futilely attacked the spaceport in order to draw a bulk of the encroaching word bearers away. Numian, Chromaticus, and Codicier Herak, one of the remaining Raven Guards, made their way towards the hidden gunship. Unfortunately, Nerak and two of his fellow word bearers followed them, having tracked the Raven Guard's psychic spore. The Raven Guard willingly sacrificed himself as he confronted the encroaching traitor marines. As Numian went to assist Grammaticus, the mortal utilized a laser digital weapon and fired it into Numian's retinal lens, burning out his eye and searing his face beneath. The trauma of it put him on his knees. Half blind, Numian snatched for the human. Grammaticus took the fulgurite artifact from Numian's scabbard, definitely avoiding the salamander's grab. Before the human departed, however, Numian wanted to know one thing, and one thing only. Did Vulcan truly live? John believed that he did. But suddenly, the pyre captain convulsed as he was shot in the back by a bolt pistol. Chromaticus froze in place as he was confronted by the dark apostle Elias himself, who stood on the lowered ramp of the gunship. Without warning, a terror reality appeared before them, and the form of the word bearer's first chaplain, Erebus, stepped forth through the warp gate. Elias thought that his master had come to help him achieve his ascension. Snatching the full gripe from John, he handed it over to the chaplain. Erebus glanced at the strange artifact, then lashed out with the lightning spear and slit his fellow dark apostle's throat. Elias sank to his knees, dying, unable to staunch the grievous wound from the god weapon. Erebus had killed his former servant for attempting to betray him. Erebus then ordered Grammaticus to take the relic, making no attempt to stop him. Cautiously, 
the human took the preferred artifact and departed Trioris in the lone gunship. <clears throat> you might be asking, why did Arubis do this? Well, to put it bluntly, at this point the Cabal wanted Horus to win the heresy. And Arubis, being a sneaky and dark character of the word bearers, probably was in contact with the secret society and knew they wanted John to use the spear to permanently kill Vulcan. <sighs> but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. <laughs> We've all John in the histories. I must mention that this is not the end for First Captain Artulius Numian. He survived his grievous wounds and attempted to make his escape, but was captured by the word bearers. He was held upon a destroyer-class ship of the Traitor Legion. It was brutally tortured until he was rescued by the Ultramarines. This actually will tie back in with John because following the successful flight from Traoris, the Kapal once again contacted Grammaticus and gave him new orders. He was to take the relic to Hedson Macrog with his fellow perpetual Damon Pritanus. Now how this connects is, is that Artulius Newman also ends up in Macrog much around the same time. But anyways, I digress. Now Damon was a different animal than his comrade John. Unlike Grammaticus, Damon held humanity in little regard and is shown to be loyal to nothing other than the Cabal. He even used the Eldar racist expression for humans, Monke. Since his discovery by the Cabal, Damon had been used as an assassin, and his list of kills is far longer than I could possibly contain in this box. Regardless, though, getting back to John's orders, when he reached the capital planet of Ultramar, he was to make contact with one of the Primarchs who had recently gathered there during the founding of the Imperium Secondus. That Primarch was Conrad Kurz, who was rampaging across Macrog after escaping the hold of the Dark Angel's flagship. The Night Haunter would use it to kill Vulcan, so that the Salamander's Primarch could not live to become the Keeper of the Gate. If he successfully accomplished this monumental task, Chromaticus was informed that his pact with the Cabal would be ended, and his destiny would be his own to choose once more. During a brief period when he was alone, John was contacted by Alderi Farseer Eldred Uthron. Uthron revealed to John that he was opposed to the Cabal's aims, and that their belief that Horus would usher in Chaos's ultimate demise was not set in stone. He believed that humanity was meant to be a firebreak against Chaos, and that without them, the Eldari would fall to the Dark Gods and the entire galaxy shortly afterwards. He offered John a way to leave the Cabal, and a chance to stop being a traitor to his own species, as John began to consider himself. Keeping this conversation to himself, John continued his quest with Damon Pritanus and joined forces with the loyalist word-bearer Barthusa Narek, who tracked John to Ultramar to take back the Fulgrite. Uh, uh, hang on a half a minute, you might be saying. Isn't this the same guy that ran John and the surviving salamanders to ground on Trioris? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be true. One and the same. Apparently, loyalist might be too strong of a word to describe this word bearer. The Astartes was loyal to the Emperor, but he truly wanted nothing more in all the galaxies than to kill the Primarch of the word bearers, Lorgar. He did not really care if Vulcan died, and he agreed that, that they could go ahead and kill Vulcan, provided that they gave him the Fulgrite so that he might be able to kill Lorgar afterwards. Well, during the crisis that followed, the trio interrupted the fight between Conrad Curse and Vulcan with the intent of killing the Salamander Primarch as planned. Confused? And so was I. <laughs> I had to look through several more books to discover what happened before this, which caused the duel between the two Primarchs. To back up a little bit to the Dropsite Massacre, Vulcan was taken prisoner by Conrad Kurz and was tortured by several months until he escaped using a teleporter and his hammer to teleport him to the upper atmosphere of Macrog. I already talked about this anyways in Where's Vulcan, but if you want to learn more about it, I recommend that you go there to Where's Vulcan 7-4-23. Now, what I didn't mention, though, in that box is that after he plummeted to the surface of Macrog, his charred body was later discovered by the Ultramarines, who at first were unable to identify the corpse as anything more than a grotesque statue, all living matter having burned up on re-entry. Over a series of days, Vulcan's body began to regenerate, eventually returning to life and shocking the ultramarine apothecaries he had been entrusted to. Realizing who he was, the apothecary summoned the Primarch, Rabute Gilliman, who was at first furious that no one could give him an answer on how or why Vulcan had suddenly fallen from the skies. To Gilliman's horror, though, he found that Vulcan was broken mentally, 
violent and incoherent, attacking anything and everything he could. Unknown to everyone, a bond of sorts had formed between Kurz and Vulcan, the latter being able to sense when the Night Haunter was nearby, making him kind of insane, very much like Kurz is. Kurz was indeed on Macrog, having been trapped aboard the Invincible Reason, but eventually breaking out of the Dark Angel's flagship and stealing a drop pod to the surface. Now, if you want to know more about the debacle of Lionel Johnson and Conrad Kurz, I may suggest the short box, The Thromus Campaign. You know, I, I find it interesting that through a lot of the boxes that I've done, John and the Cabal have been working behind the scenes, influencing much of what we've already discussed. Huh. Well, where was I? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vulcan broke free of his bonds and pillaged Gilliman's private armory before setting off to hunt Kurz. The two fought across the entire city. Vulcan finally realizing his regenerative abilities as a Primarch and using them to his advantage. By focusing his will, he could regenerate much quicker. At one point, Kurz shot Vulcan's head off, causing the Primarch to fall from a cliff. Vulcan was back alive before he even hit the ground. Now that you have a little bit more understanding, we can continue on John's involvement. The rolling duel of the two Primarchs was eventually stopped by the perpetual John Grammaticus, who stabbed Vulcan through the heart, killing both of them in a psychic explosion. Grammaticus regenerated, however, as he always does, but was aware this time that it would be his last. Vulcan never recovered. But this was all ruse by the clever Grammaticus for he had decided at the last moment to side with his own people instead of the Cabal, and used the Fulgurite to heal Vulcan of the madness that had consumed him, though it left him in a death-like coma and took away John's status as a perpetual, restoring his mortality. But wait a minute, you just said John regenerated like he always did. But how did he do that if he had been restored mortality? This, unfortunately, I don't have an answer to. But perhaps the answer is in what happened next. After this ordeal, Grammaticus returned to consciousness to find himself aboard an unknown craft world being tended to by the Aldari. Damon Pritanus informed Grammaticus that he was mortal once more, and that his next death would be permanent, and that the Cabal had one final mission. Yet again, whether he was willing or not, John was effectively taken prisoner by Pritanus and held in this Eldari facility that generated the illusion that it was actually a farm. However, before John found out what his final mission actually was, the facility was infiltrated by Eldred Uthron and Barthusa Nerek. After a struggle, the unusual pair slew Pritanus with a piece of Fulgurite. Now, this is one of those interesting points where we can actually see Fulgurite killing a perpetual. But getting back to our question, I think that perhaps Damien might have lied about not being a perpetual thing to John either to make him suffer, because they were far from friends, or to inspire him with final freedom. After all, what would the Cabal want with a simple mortal? Regardless, Eldred asked Grammaticus where Olenius Persson was, to which the Psyker answered that he did not know. The Farseer and Narek then took Grammaticus and stepped into a webway portal. Using a pair of Eldar scissors that could cut through space and time that were given to him by Eldred, John Grammaticus appeared near the ruins of Ababa Hive on Terra during the siege. Now I have to stop a moment. If you had listened to our original story on John Grammaticus, this is the part where we were confused and joked about. Eldar scissors? It turns out these scissors do exist. And they're actually pretty cool. They're known as uh, wraithbone shears. And they're an ancient Eldar relic that allow their wielders to travel through the warp and reach distant locations. Uh, unfortunately, they're not a precise tool, and multiple uses are required to reach the wielder's destination. Even then, the shears will likely not send them into the precise location that they were desiring to go, and may accidentally send their wielders into the past or future. <sighs> if that occurs, the wielder will have to retrace their steps with the shears and try again to arrive in the right time frame. So, after much cutting, I'm assuming... John showed up where he wanted to on Terra. He made his way across the devastating world, eventually reaching Gulb of Maratwana. This was the home of the powerful perpetual Urda, 
who was at first dismissive of John and his goals, reaching the interior of the Imperial Palace. Now, I have to stop here for half a second. It seems like every person that John runs into is a perpetual. And it makes it seem like perpetuals are kind of like a dime or dozen. They really actually aren't. He just happens to be lucky. That's probably the best way of just describing it. Anyways, I, I just had to mention that. Moving on. John knew that he could not defeat Horus, but thought he could save humanity by reaching the Emperor and stopping his ambitions. Erda was shocked to discover that John had recruited old Persol to his cause, but told John he had not arrived yet. John became worried, as he had planned a rendezvous at Erda's home with Persol. Erda later was able to determine that Persol was due to arrive at Terra two weeks after John and gave him her Space Marine prototype protector, Letu, to aid him in his quest to find Ol. Now we can get back to Ol. After a seeming eternity of travels throughout space and time, Olanius and his group finally emerged on Terra. However, they found themselves in the Hate and Takaya hive region, now occupied by the Emperor's children, and transformed into a horrific dream garden known as Paradise. Within Paradise, desperate civilians seeking escape from the horrors of the Siege of Terra were entrapped within vines and had their dreams harvested by the Emperor's children. Who consumed them. Ol and his group were only saved from Paradise and the Emperor's children by John Grammaticus and Letu. During the struggle to escape Paradise, Bail Ron was slain by Selenashi demons, and the group was nearly again overcome before being saved by Octia and a space marine identifying himself as Alpharius. Despite the pleas of John, Olinius agreed to have the duo aid them in their quest. Now I'm sure you are wondering, like I was at this point, the devil is Octea. Oh, that was a toughie. But she actually has an interesting backstory. You see, Octea isn't her original name. Her original name was Serene Valentian. Serene was the sole survivor of the destruction of the word bearer's perfect city of Monarchia by the Ultramarines, losing her sight amid the blinding light of the Lance Orbital Bombardment. Thereafter, she was worshipped by many of those who followed the word bearer's ideals, and was made a confessor by Lorgar himself. Serene became very close to and trusted by Argel Tal and Zaphin, who came to her with their troubles. Now, I won't get into who these people are, but they're word bearers. As the Horus Heresy began to take shape, and the word bearers began to earnestly worship the ruinous powers, Serene was killed by a party of Legio Custodes, who had been left to accompany the word bearer legion and to observe and report to the Emperor should they once again start deviating from the Imperial truth. Cyrene was, sadly, simply in the custodian's way, as they fought to send word to the Emperor of the Wordbearer's heresy. Argel Tal swore vengeance on them, and slew the custodies on the sands of Estuan V, taking a unique power sword and guardian spear from their bodies, which would become his preferred weapons. Lorgar held the Confessor in such high esteem that he even named one of his three secretly built Abyss-class battleships the Blessed Lady in her honor. Later, she was resurrected by Erebus as part of his scheme to better control Argel Tal. However, she was apparently killed again during the Shadow Crusade when the Fidelitas Alex was heavily damaged. In truth, she had reached an escape pod and met Cabal agents led by Demon Pritanis, who revealed that she was a perpetual since her resurrection and asked her to come with him. Cyrene then took up a new identity known as Actia and disguised herself as an acolyte of the cult of the Blessed Lady. She was recruited by the word bearers to help Fulgrim in the preparation for Horus' drive on Terra. Actia led them through the webway and then to the palace of Slanesh, where Fulgrim was eventually found and bound by Zardu Leak, using his true name. All these events were part of Lorgar's plan to usurp Horus as the anointed chaos, but in the end, Actia tipped off the War Master to the treachery. This combined with Laak freeing Fulgrim instead of using him to attack Horus, as originally planned, resulted in Lorgar's coup failing and the Primarch being banished. Afterwards, Laak confronted Actia and revealed that he not only knew it was her who informed the War Master, but he had also looked into the history of the Valentian cult, and no record of an individual named Actia had ever existed. Laak asked just who or what exactly Actia was, but she refused to answer and left. And the next time she appears in records is on Terra, saving John and the gang. Whew. 
I know, folks, this is a lot to take in, but bear with me. We've almost reached the end of John's story. He just got to hold on a little bit longer. <sighs> Anyways, together, the group, now known affectionately by Grammaticus as the Argonauts, acquired an Arvis lighter and flew to the Imperial Palace across Terra's ravaged landscape. However, as they crossed the front line, they were shot down and crashed into the inner palace. Ole and the others were guided by Alpharius into the hidden passages with the intent to reach the Sanctum Imperialis. Within the depths of the secret entrance into the palace, John learned that this Alpharius was actually Ingle Peck, who pled with John for help to free him from the control of Actia, who intended to use him to her own ends. During their discussion, John was almost killed by Matthias Herzog, another Alpha Legionnaire, by Peck. Now, I'm sure you have two questions here. One, who is this Ingo Peck fella? And two, what was Actia's true intent? Well, as the concerns of Ingo Peck, you can find a detailed chronicling of this Stardace in our new Vox, Notable Alpha Legion Characters, 9-19-23. And you find him at the time of 4546. As to Actia's nefarious schemes... That remains to be seen. What? Well, after the apparent betrayal, John turned on Actia by pointing a pistol at her head. However, thanks to the pleading of Ol Person and the psychic confirmation of Cat that she did not intend to help Horus, John spared Actia and they continued to the throne room. Within the throne room, the group came before Vulcan and Actia confirmed that Horus was the Dark King who intended to ascend to be the fifth god of chaos. Also, upon finally reaching the Golden Throne, Vulcan informed them that they were too late, and the Emperor had since departed to the Vengeful Spirit to fight Horus. Unfortunately, what happened to the Argonauts after this has been swallowed up by time, and these strange characters of history just simply vanished, much to the chagrin of this frustrated historian. And to those of you who I'm sure are still listening... <laughs> <sighs> I, of course, will not leave you on such a cliffhanger, and will give you a couple of hypotheses. Now, keep in mind these are not chronicled anywhere, just some educated guesses by being that of being around for quite a bit of time, about, who 80 million years. But anyways, with the concerns of old Person, I believe he met his fate on the vengeful spirit. The legend of Pius Person is too large to not have some sort of truth to it. How he died is up for debate, be it by the hands of Horus, who had enough warp energy coursing through him that he could definitely kill a perpetual, or perhaps in a darker twist of fate. The Emperor found him first, recognized him, and obliterated him for his past transgressions. Actia, as far as I know, is still at large. Her plots and ideas her own, but perhaps she got a taste of power and rules the little system in the far reaches of the galaxy? Sounds a lot like what she would do. As to our main protagonist, John Grammaticus, I haven't the foggiest of what happened to him. If he truly was turned mortal, then I can say he is definitely dead. Too much time has passed since the heresy, some 10,000 years ago. Yet, if he's still a perpetual, that's a different story. Perhaps he slowly went mad over the millennia. Drifting from planet to planet, telling deranged stories of the Cabal to any daft fool who was willing to listen. Perhaps he actually did find a way to eventually kill himself, and is no more. Personally, because I like a happy ending, I like to think that he's retired to a planet, far away from the hustle and bustle of Terra, relaxing in the shade of a large fruit tree, finally at peace. A nice thought, but any of these could be right. And, unfortunately, on that note... I must return to my regular duties of chronicling the Milky Way system from Kulu. <laughs> For, I mean, the one who shall not be named. If you enjoyed this box, please like, subscribe, comment, and follow. And as always, <clears throat> this is Zekthar, signing off.